picked up as well. Okay, great. All right, so let's see. We talked about linting comments. Um, so, all right, so what do you want to talk about today? Uh, I was uh, going through uh, models and stuff, and uh, I noticed that uh, I don't know if there is another way to do this, but uh, I was trying to tune the parameters. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, uh, should I share my Yeah, screen? why don't you share your screen, yeah. Uh, can you see the screen now? Yes. Okay, so I, I was uh, trying to uh, tune the parameters, and uh, I noticed that uh, if you uh, try to change the parameters of a model that is saved into a directory, uh, it doesn't really change the, the uh, hyperparameters at all. Uh, I don't know if there is another way to do this, but uh, uh, let's see. Uh, so I'm uh, running this model, this SVC, and it's saved in Scikit SVC, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, I go ahead and uh, reinitialize the model, and I, if I choose the same directory and uh, declare an absurd parameter, it will just uh, give me uh, the same accuracy as the one before because it's, the, it's actually the same model that's uh, uh, yeah. shown here. Yeah, okay. So, and I think this was, let's see. So, because I think what happened here, yeah. So basically we were tying the model to the directory and if you have an existing model, it's just going to load that model. So I think this is part of that um, project. So see here, your project um, to look at the uh, saving and loading of the... Um, the model config into these, you know, we, you're going to yes, eventually, yes. yeah. So I think that, um, I think that, let's see, yeah, let's jump back here. Because okay, what's happening right now is it basically just says there's a model in that directory, load the model. Um, yeah, and... I went to the model uh, and uh, 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 just a second. Yeah, uh, it, it shows this function which talks about doing that. And it has a bunch of code in it, which is not really used here. Mm -hmm. And it just uh, returns the path. Yeah, this is all. So, yeah, we went through a, a whole transition of trying to get rid of that. Yeah, that applicable features needs to go. Um, so what we had done was. Oh, sorry. Um, so what we had done was we had used all of the config parameters to decide what the what the model was that got saved within that directory um, and that ended up confusing people um, because it was um, uh, well basically so if you change the config parameters and you pointed it at the same directory then um, then uh, you'd end up with uh, you, you you'd end up with the config well you'd end up you, you could end up with multiple models in the same directory um and then you, you it wasn't exactly clear which one you were using and it was just based off of the the config um so like the config structure and so if you change the config structure at all you might end up with several different models within the same directory and you're not really exactly sure which one you're using um so we may want to make this a little more and this is sort of you know part of the whole thing we may want to make this a little more um uh, yeah, the question is really, you know, figuring out this whole saving and loading thing. Um, and, you know, because we, we should be doing that on a, on the a enter method, right. Um, is where we yeah. should be, where we should be loading the models. And the question is like, okay, well, well, do you load uniquely based off of a directory? Um, right. And, and if you override the, 
if you override the if you set a different config parameter for the same directory right do you want it to blow up and say hey you already had a model saved in that directory um uh you see what i'm saying um yeah because because that's sort of the situation we're in right now is if you change that config parameter um but the model is still pointed at the same directory then then you know should we make the person point it at a new directory um to have a new hyper parameter or could we say that the i think i think you know the you know the uh yeah wouldn't like, it be okay to just overwrite uh, the directory well, we could overwrite the directory. Yeah, we could overwrite the directory. The problem is, you know, we're we're loading the contents right um, from the directory. So this is sort of where it comes in. Where uh, what we do is we'd save the config, we'd save the model config, um, you know, without the directory. I can't remember. I think we had a meeting when we talked about that at one point. Um, but we'd save the model config without the directory, um, and then we'd load it back. Right, and then we'd look at the config structure, and we see if it matches. You know, the we'd look at the config structure that we've been instantiated with, and we see if it matches the one that's on disk. And if it does, then you know we we know we want to do the same thing. Um, uh, you know, we know we want to use that that checkpoint um, that's on disk or whatever the saved state is. Otherwise, you know, we might need to we would use a method that basically says, hey, you know, just load from that saved state that's on disk um, and ignore, you know, whatever might be the um, the the current config state, right? Um, so this would be the case where you basically instantiate a model. So there's two cases. There's the case where you, or I guess there's three cases. Okay, so maybe we should write this out. Um, um, how should we do this? Um, let's open here. I'll just open a text document and we can write it out. Uh, this is a good one for the arch uh, docs arch. Um, um, zero, 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 three. Uh, model saving and loading. Okay. All right, and I'll share my screen in a second here. Okay. So yeah, let's enumerate all the cases and figure this out. I think we've changed things many times, and and uh, you know it's time to, it's time to make sure that everything is correct because um, we have half half changed things at times and and haven't finished changing it all. Um, so that's and that is this project, right? So okay, so all right, we have so and can everybody see the screen well enough? Does anybody need the yeah. text to be bigger? Yes. All right. Okay. So we have, um, we have, we currently have inconsistencies in the way that models are saved and loaded uh, due to changes in the code base over time. Um. All right. Um. All right. So what we want to do is, uh, we want to get to a place, or so, okay, so this is the question is, we want to formalize um, how models are saved and loaded, um, how they interact with their um, config structures, um, which takes pre precedence, which properties 
take precedence. Uh, saved or in memory config properties. Um, uh, is there anything else we want to do here? So let's see, we want to make sure that we understand how they interact with their config structures. Um, we want to make sure that we know which takes precedence. Um, is there anything we're missing here? We'll figure it out as we go, but all right. So let's let's enumerate the cases. So um, we have the following cases. Um, so model is instantiated without um, or with config uh, no existing saved state in directory. Okay. And then we'll just do this. So model class and Okay. So, and then what else do we have? So Then we have the fact that model dir is true. So so we have the case where um, we have the case where model is instantiated with config. Um, there's save state in the directory. Um, let's see. And let's see, what else did we talk about? Um, and then we had, so, okay, we, and then there's this one that you just discovered, right? So we have, um, or that you just highlighted, so, oops. So we have state in the directory, um, and now we're saying, you know, there's this config parameter there that we're we're overriding. So, um, so, and then we can say, you know, like uh, saved value of C is two. Okay. So save state in directory, save state uh, conflicts with model. Uh, so your save state conflicts with the instantiated model config properties. Um, so for example, the save state is 42, um, and but now we have this this uh, C of, of a million or 10 million or whatever. Um, so is there any other cases here that we're not seeing right now um, while we're trying to enumerate them? Um, uh, I don't know if this counts as a case, but uh, I also tried to directly access uh, the config and edit the parameters there. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, uh, Model dot config dot c is equal to a million. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so after instantiating the model. Yeah, yeah. Uh, using the same model actually. Uh, mm -hmm. In these cases, uh, we tried to instantiate, re instantiate it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you. <laughs> let's see. Let me just. Yeah. Let me just be clear on what you did here. So. You did model, and then, and then you said you know model dot config dot dot c. Equals, yeah. Yeah. All right, and this and, is between. And, and it actually changes it if you print the model, uh, like print statement the model. Mm -hmm. uh, it shows it changed uh, there, but uh, I don't know. It doesn't work. Yeah, because it's not reinstantiating that model. 
Um, yeah, yeah. And I think the thing is, so that's a good that's a good one to track. So those those config structures should be frozen. Um, so that I think is a separate issue because I think we shouldn't. Let's see. Yeah, those properties within the config structure, um, you know, they are. Um, yeah, they're assumed they're assumed to be static. Um, so let's see, they were originally static because we were using name tuples, and then we converted the data classes, and I don't think we made them frozen. Um, and I think that's probably what's going on here. Um, so because or else you wouldn't have been able to change it. Um, so yeah, so you basically wanted to just tweak the. You just wanted to tweak the model parameter and then re redo an yeah. operation, right? Like a different train. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, I was trying uh, to see if we are able to own the model mm -hmm. uh, by uh, without having to reinstantiate it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's see. And so, but and and the thing is, so you wanted to train the model. You wanted to tweak the parameter and train the model again, right? And then uh, yeah. and then and then not um, without. So so yeah. I I have a point here, like. Uh, there are two types of configurations you might have in a model config. One is that uh, that would affect the architecture of the model and cannot be changed once the model is made or saved. And the others are which are hyperparameters and should be changed. Should we should be able to change them, right? Okay. So, like something like property setter or something that. So yeah. it could be used to like you know uh, uh, start a hook once a property is changed, the thing has changed inside also. Yeah. Okay, let's see. So now we have, so basically, uh, uh, let's see, what would we call these? Uh, architecture. Okay, yeah, that's right. Uh, just to clarify, uh, the whole point of my uh, tweaking was also to change the hyperparameters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and okay, and so obviously, so the setup right now was was basically you know, because because a lot of this has been done from the command line, right? Um, and so the the Python API has has not really been has been more of an afterthought a lot of the times. Um, and so uh, you know when we when we did different models, we would have different um, uh, directories, um, and then you know you tune. To, you change the hyperparameters between invocations of the command line, right? Um, and so now, as we're doing more Python API stuff, um, you know, we're finding we're finding things like this, right? Um, so let's see. So architecture parameters. Um, so architecture parameters, um, which fundamentally alter the model, uh, so, and which might, might want to change. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's think about this in more depth. So, so the question is, okay, so at what point do we call it, to what point do we call it a new model, right? Um, do we want to call it a new model when the hyperparameters change? Because this, this, so these two, these two, um, uh, man, I wish you could see the visual highlight, but these two things sort of, to some extent, if, affect this case here, right? Where we're looking at the uh, the saved state, right? So if we want to load it and we want to tweak the value, right? Do we do we um, do we are we okay with tweaking the value on load? Are we only okay with not tweak? Like if you if you declare a hyperparameter that is a tweakable hyperparameter, um, are we okay with tweaking it while it's loaded, uh, or like when it's loaded? Or are we only okay with tweaking it at runtime, right? Because here we're okay with tweaking it at runtime. You know, maybe it was loaded to a value of, of 10 million. Um, let's just make it a million. Um, so maybe it was loaded to a value of a million, but now we want to tweak it at runtime to a value of 42, right? But do we 
do we want to throw an exception saying, hey, this isn't the tr same model? Um, like if you're trying to mo load a model with a hyperparameter of, uh, you know, 10 million, um, but I'm trying to load it from from a safe state, um, you know, and I and I want to give you the accuracy, then, uh, you know, will I give you the accuracy using the hyperparameter or or the new hyperparameter, or will I give you the accuracy using the old hyperparameter, right? Um, uh, I, what I, what I think about this is, like, if user is uh, giving some hyper, overwriting some hyperparameter, then it is his own decision, right? So it should be, like, not the, no, what the, uh, the uh, parameter that the user is providing should be used, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, and uh, it, if it is not an architectural one, if it is an architectural one, then we, we should reject it and say like that it is not possible to do that. Yeah, it would make uh, things a lot simple if we just uh, completely override the parameters and not keep the previous parameters, uh, the hyperparameters. Mm -hmm. Okay, override if these are not the same. Okay, so let's see. Raise exception if these are not the same, All right? So in this case, you know, save value is 42. Uh, save value of C will become a million. Um, okay. Um, and so then let's see. Not a saving one. Okay. So if the model is, so models instantiated with config, um, we have save state, um, we have the, a conflict with the save state. Uh, architectural conflict, raise an exception, hyperparameter conflict, override the hyperparameter. Um, let's see, and then with the new accuracy stuff, I think that should be fine because we're not going to like save the old accuracy with the old hyperparameter. Um, let's see. Um, okay, anything else here? Anything else while we're looking at this um, in, a, in a planning context phase? So this also lets us know that we probably need some kind of config, um, you know, some kind of, of way of, of telling, um, you know, telling the model which which is, or well, let's see. Uh, which is architecture and which mm -hmm. is... Yeah, because when we're thinking okay. about auto-tuning stuff, this was another thing that came into play. Um, oops. Uh, when we were thinking about... Um, so this has cross applicability. Okay, so yeah. So when we're thinking about auto ML, uh, in our thoughts about auto ML, thoughts about auto ML. We um, knew that there will be. Um, uh, model per model properties uh, config properties that are tunable and some that are not tunable um, so in uh, these we knew that we'd have to add um, so so for this for this to be something that um, so for uh, something like auto ml which spans across models uh, we knew that there would have to be a standard definition um, uh, standard way of defining tunable versus non-tunable 
uh, across models. Okay, yeah. Um, properties. So, so tunable or mutable? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I'm just, just yeah. Mutable, mutable works. Yeah, mutable is a better. Um, well, let's say because this is this is talking about the the things we want to tune. Um, so this basically maps. Um, now that'll be a good next sentence. So uh, within the context of this discussion. Um, that's because that's more background. Uh, this becomes uh, tunable and non-tunable uh, become mutable and non-mutable. Right. Um, so these are... So these are immutable. Um, All right. Um, great. Um, so, so we should. Yeah. Now, now we'll want to. Um, let's see. So, what we'll want to do is add infrastructure or add to the config infrastructure to 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 allow for. Um, let's see. Um, let's see. What what do we have? DF file base. Um, so, if we look at the config infrastructure here. Um, we need to add, let's see, field metadata, uh, required field, where's field, um, here's field. So basically we'll want to add, you know, something that's, um, uh, immutable or let's see, should we tag it as mutable? We should probably tag it as mutable and leave it immutable by default. Um, so basically, you know, we'll add this field here, mutable, um, and that, because that was sort of within the context of the other. Um, so basically, you should assume that if you change values, you should assume as, as someone using these values, uh, and, and this is sort of the way the name tuple works. Um, so um, similar to the way name tuple, um, so... So, uh, what is it? This is typing. Um, fields or properties. Config properties will default to immutable. Um, this way, uh, writers of, uh, you know, basically anything that is. Uh, so writers of, um, so implementers of classes can assume they don't need to deal with state changes, state changes to config properties unless they've explicitly opted in. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So now, yeah. now, yeah. So uh, any questions on that? Okay. No. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, I think, I think this is a good way to, this, this seems to make sense. Um, all right, so yeah, we'll add this mutable field, um, and that way, you know, this mutable field is also something that we know that uh, it's a it's a target for tuning when we get to auto ML, um, and from the perspective of of you know the the stuff that has going on with model saving and loading right now, uh, we know mutable is basically overwritable. So within the context of this discussion, um, let's see, in the following case, um, you know, uh, C. So let's see, C is a mutable property. Um, when we load the model, um, 
the uh, in memory uh, value of 1 million will take precedence over take precedence over the saved state of um, 42. All right, is that, are we in agreement on that or should it be in reverse? This seems yeah. not to be. Okay, so let's see, so this is an important thing that we're deciding. Um, so let's see. Um, now, okay. Okay. So in the following case, see the premium of property when we load property. Okay. So this is what we're deciding here. Um, So, okay. Um, all right, let's see. Anything else here that we need to talk about? So basically, C, so anything that's a, 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 um, a mutable property, um, let's see. So we'll have these config structures. Uh, yeah. It, it would also work uh, without reinstantiating the model, right? Yes, right. So, so if it's too, so if it's if it's immutable, you have to reinstantiate the model. Um, if it's immutable, or sorry, if it's immutable, you have to reinstantiate the model. If it's mutable, then you don't have to reinstantiate the model. Right. Okay, so and let's just write that because it's for clarity. I like this is good. I like these uh, this format for the architecture stuff. This is this has been very helpful to guide the discussion. Um, all right, so let's see. So um, so changes to immutable uh, if a user wants to change an immutable. Uh, property, uh, they must create a new instance of the object slash config. Okay. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, I think that also follows that. Um, so uh, for, for fields, so for config fields marked as mutable it, it isn't isn't this the a reverse at the last statement so if a user wants to change an immutable property they must create a new instance of the object slash config uh, since the property Sorry. cannot be modified Okay, then let's just. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, so let's see. Uh, and let's write an example here. So. Uh, okay, I'm a little confused here. So we're making it uh, so that uh, the hyperparameters are not uh, changeable at runtime. Uh, the hyperparameters are changeable at runtime. So let's let's do so. If a user, so this is so this is the saved value. Actually, you know, this may need to be. Let's see. This has to do with saving and uh, loading. Because uh, because the previous statement says that config properties will default to immutable. 
Yes, config properties will default to immutable. Um, so you'd have to set them explicitly. Um, so, oh, oh, okay. So let's okay, see. My bad. I no, no worries. That. So let's see. Config fields. Uh, where did we say so? Where did we say that so? Uh, above the Python code okay, block. Okay, great. Um, okay, so this is the context. This is the decision. Okay. Um, so sorry, I'm, as I move things around here, so try to put things into their right places. So, okay, so this is our context. Um, we want to formalize this with the following cases. Um, um, you know, this is what we're dealing with. We have two cases. Um, so we found that there's two types of model parameters. Um, we uh, decided there are two types of model parameters. Um, um, so then there's immutable ones and there's mutable ones. Um, and let's uh, sort of put this data down in the other section here. Um, so that it's not in the context. Um, so our context, you know, we have immutable and we have mutable. Um, we talk about, you know, when we were talking about implementing automobile ML, these, these map to tunable. Um, so uh, tunable and tunable and not tunable becomes mutable versus immutable. Um, so now we're saying basically that similar to the way the name tuple works, and so all our config stuff came from name tuple, um, you know, config properties will default to immutable. Um, so this way implementers of classes can assume that they don't need to deal with state changes to config properties unless they've explicitly opted in. Um, so in this case, you know, we have a little config example, some, so some example code here. Uh, model class or uh, my model config um, um, and we say you know C uh, field int equals field so this is the field um, C uh, hyperparameter Um, is that, isn't that, um, I think that can be one word. Uh, and so mutable equals true. Um, all right, so yeah, so now we have the C hyperparameter. It is mutable. Let's see. Um, okay. Uh, in the following example, we have a hyperparameter, and let's see, I think we have this down here. So in the following example, we have a hyperparameter C. Um, and uh, so we want to we want to support changes to it at runtime. Okay, um, so this sort of raises, there's, there's, a, there's another, there's, let's see, so, okay, so I'm thinking about nested config, but I don't know if we need to think about this, because I think nested config ends up being a separate object, so we don't need to actually worry about that. So, uh, our model wants to support changes to it at runtime. Um, so if we change C, um, so we instantiate the model, we change C, um, let's say default, or let's say, sorry, C equals zero. Now C equals 42. Um, so at this point, um, okay. So, so the model needs to do something at this point. Um, you know, when when it uh, 
when it when it detects a change to C, right? So the model needs to 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 something needs to happen, right? Um, so maybe it needs it probably needs some kind of property to to handle that, right? And it probably needs to register this stuff with the config structure. So for example, um, in the init method of the model. Um, it uh, it will need to tell the config structure that when C, so we're going to need to do some 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 like setters and getters and stuff. Um, so basically, so config right now is this data is 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 a data class, um, and we may just you know uh, get rid of the whole data class thing because at this point we're going to be <laughs> the point of the data class is to uh, um, you know help us with the type hints and 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 all of that. So, but we may just you know create the classes by hand. Um, uh, using the, the type um, built in. Um, so let's see. So because we're going to need to make um, these properties, right? And so we're going to need to make each, each. Uh, so these, so when I say property, I mean uh, like the Python built in um, property. Um, oops, where's no manual entry for property? So let me just bring this up here. Um, So this is the Python built-in property, right? And so we're, we're looking at setters and getters, um, right? And so what we'd want is we'd want to implement a setter that basically throws an exception um, if it's immutable. Um, and uh, we'd want to implement, a, you know, the getter will be a pass-through. Um, and we could even do this. Uh, we could even do this as a... We could even do this as a with get at her and set at her um we'll probably just you know we want to check that out um see which is which is better because this is let's see yeah yeah this might be more convenient type of thing here we could probably use um we could probably use something like this um and then use um uh like a we could use a use like a, a we could let's see so we could use something like this to say um um, as we go through here, um, you know, we could basically look at, okay, create the, okay, so we end up, we, we're given a class, right, when we do the, the config decorator here, that's this, um, and so it's given a class with all these properties, um, and what we can do is we can do something similar to data class. We'll want to look at data class and see, um, what it does because it has that frozen um, let's see so that frozen attribute would be good to understand so let's look at their code okay Frozen. Okay, get at her. What are they doing? Frozen get down at her. Set new at her. Cannot overwrite. Or function in frozen get down at hers. What are they doing here? Okay. Fields. Okay, so they set at her. Oh, wow, interesting. Um, can I feel they're actually creating, they're using this, they're actually, they're actually, um, <laughs> um, uh, like compiling a function, it looks like. Um, yeah, they're compiling and executing a function. In, very interesting. Um, so, Okay, so but but the end result is basically that they are let's see, set at her and del at her Fill string. Alright, so they're overriding the set at her and del at her methods at the class level rather than at like a property level. Um, so they're not using, you know, property, they're they're doing it at the at the get at her and set at her and del at her level. Um, so basically at the at the class scope. Um, so let's see. Um, 
Okay, anyways, we're a little in the weeds here. But, um, all right. So, in this case, right, we'll change. We'll need to, the point of this was um, the config structure itself, mm, uh, this, like, config class itself, when it's instantiated, um, it will need some sort of, uh, like, callback functions for the modification of mutable values. Um, so, you know, for example, like, set C um, or something like that. Um, or maybe, so we could do it basically at the method scope or we could do it at, at the, so we could do it at the scope of the, the uh, on a single property value. Um, so basically we could have, you know, set C equals, you know, some function, um, uh, you know, C and then say, uh, for example, if we'd been doing, um, so self dot model dot C equals C, right? So we could do it at this level, um, or we could do it at, um, you know, mutable, Uh, we could do it at this level, right, where we have key value. Um, and then, um, does that make sense? So we have two approaches here, right? We could do it on the individual property level, or you could sort of say that, uh, you know, the config structure, if it has any any fields that are marked mutable, then it must define um, some kind of callback function, um, like this mutable callback function um, that that um, that 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 allows for modification, right? Um, because or otherwise we won't we won't know that we need to go pick up the changes, right? Um, does that does that make sense, to everyone? Yes. Yeah. Does that sound good? So the other option is we can basically just trigger. Um, so we can trigger the. Uh, let's see. So we could probably. Let's see. Yeah. So we could trick. We could just trigger a function call. Um, let's see. What do what do what do other languages do? Things usually do like an event. Um, like if you looked at like JavaScript or something like that. Um, yeah, I think, I think this is probably, um, this probably makes the most sense, the second approach here. Um, so, okay. Um, and I know we're, we're running long talking about this, but this is complicated. So, uh, so, all right. So now basically when we set, um, now, okay. So, so this is what, what, um, uh, so we require... We require that a callback function function be registered uh, before modification of uh, mutable values. Um, otherwise, you know, they'd raise an exception. Uh, modification. Uh, would raise an exception. Uh, and in this way that in this way we ensure that the that the that the whoever is is whoever has declared a value mutable has also, you know, gone and and uh, um let's see, that's the thing. Okay. So so you could declare a value mutable, but then if you don't if somebody modifies that value, uh, I'm trying to think about how do we ensure that that authors of models always um you know, always always actually go and and uh and uh um you know register the, the appropriate callback, right? Um so let's see because you risk so we risk um so we risk we risk a case here uh where a model author um you know register or uh, doesn't register a mutable callback right so if they don't do this um 
and then somebody uses their model and they and they mutate the and they, and they they never they write their test cases and they never mutate the value they're never going to find out that they forgot to register this mutable callback until somebody goes and does it right um so the question is how can't, would can't we can't we write a single uh, setting sub like some sort of mechanism in the base class itself which base to, class to this like uh, the model base class from which simple model would inherit and uh, all of these models would inherit. Yeah, so if, yeah, we, so if, we can't uh, do if, that. If a mutable parameter is like changed, then uh, this kind of setting is done. Yeah, sort of. yeah. So we can do that. The qu the thing just becomes, um, you know, if if you have so, for example, for a lot of models where we're doing this uh, a pass through type of thing. Um, so, for example, a model um, scikit scikit like so for example in scikit um you know we basically uh let's see where is it let's see Okay. Uh, okay. Let's, um, I'll psych it to follow. I'll psych it. Um, so here's where we're instantiating the models. So we go and we grab the classes. So, so these are the scikit classes, right? Um, so these are these are being pulled from from scikit, um, and then we set them. Um, you know, uh, let's see. So where do we do? We say, you know, the uh, where is it? Model config. Model. Okay, so we say scikit model, right? Equals that that class. So then when we're here in the scikit model. Um, Okay, so okay, yeah. So here, when we do the a enter, and this is exactly, you know, the, the this is exactly we, we've gone a roundabout way to come to the code that is causing that problem um, that you're talking about. So, so this is the actual code that that causes that issue, right? Where we're doing if the if the path is a file, then we load the file, right? Um, and this is where that ten thousand or that ten million parameter didn't get picked up uh, because it loaded it straight from the file. Um, and yeah. this and this yeah so and this, and this is the case where there is nothing and so it instantiates it and it passes you know the config dictionary here right so the the thing is that this is specific to the scikit models um and it changes based on every model or every um uh, object you know in in uh, in dffml you know might have a different property that it's actually mutating um under the hood so for example, if somebody changed the C parameter, we really want to change self.clf.c. Um, does that make sense? Rather than like self.c. And so we don't know what that is at the at the base yeah. base class implementation level. Yes, exactly. We don't have access. To that. Yeah, and and so this this becomes a question: is is you know how do we how do we ensure that um, how do we ensure that uh, the how do we ensure that there is that there is a um, a method to call right um, so that somebody doesn't potentially uh, not know that they need to do this if they're declaring something mutable? Um, so uh, we might have to update that model example and documentation. Yeah, we... yeah, yeah. Because well, so and the main the main risk here is is if since we have this system where we have a variety of plugin authors, right? Uh, we have we also have a a, a situation where. Um, you know, if we have to go, we're going to have to go and change all the existing plugins, right? Um, and so, this is to to some extent to make sure that we don't 
forget, right, when we go and do modifications, right, to all the code to tag things as mutable and, immu and, and immutable, right? Um, so we're going to need to make sure that that we went and added this, uh, that, re that we went and registered that mutable callback um, before any of the, any of the config, um, any of the config values could be mutated. Um, one way that we could do, okay, so you guys see what I'm saying, right? Um, how do we ensure that this self dot config dot underscore mutable line uh, gets run? Yeah. Um, so one way, and and ideally we could do it on config um, class instantiation, but that doesn't end up that doesn't end up working um, because obviously we don't have the model yet. We take the config class and we pass it to the model. So this may not be it may not be um, you know it may not be like we could raise we could raise an exception um, on the getter if it doesn't so so you know we really we need to raise an exception um, uh, so so if we don't if we don't have this mutable um, you know underscore mutable then we won't be able to um, you know we won't be able to mutate the values right and so what we could do is we could just um, raise the exception on git too right so if you if you tried to use the config if you tried to use any of the values like self.config.directory um for example um you know uh if you tried to do this uh you know it would raise exception um but if you did it here then no exception Right. Um, so basically, we could implement the, the getter and setter methods um, so that they check as early as possible, um, you know, to make sure that 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 this mutable has been set. And that way, we'll probably ch catch the most cases. Um, you know, that way, we probably don't end up with anybody having not set that mutable callback. Uh, OK, so let's see. This is ending up taking the entire meeting. So we may want to we may want to talk about this more next week because I think we still have more to cover here, um, and uh, we have more to document because there was a lot there that didn't get documented in in why we're making this decision. So does anybody have anything that they want to add to this right now, other than uh, you know, like in, anything that you want to add to this? Um, because we can write it down and we can talk about it next week. But I think that it warrants further discussion as well in, in how we want to do the implementation on this. It looks good to me. Okay. So, so let's see. So let's just say um, We registered with the config uh, class uh, this way we ensure uh, that modification mutable values uh, is um, handled somewhere um, all right, so uh, to that plugin authors, class. so to combat class authors from declaring uh, properties as mutable um, without registering. Uh, the callback will uh, raise will raise an exception um, uh, if the callback hasn't been met registered and any property is accessed. Um, the class is exported um, 
or let's see the instance it's exported or all right so if a property is set or retrieved um, or the instance is exported uh, then we'll we'll raise an exception um, and hopefully that will prevent people from forgetting to set the callback because um, if they've set the callback you know at least they should see it you know they've set it immutable they can write this in their code and say um, you know config mutable is is you know basically this function that that does something but you know they'll they should have two places in their code they should have a place in their code where they declared it as mutable and they should have a place place in their code where they handled it right and then if they can't figure out why it's not doing something then ideally they they should see that right um and the problem will be within their code base and not just the fact that they haven't done something at all um so there will be something to change um okay all right, so let's come back to this. Um, let me just make sure that we have um, the following parameter. Um, changes at runtime. So mutable self.config.c. And now we have assert um, model.c equals 42. All right. Uh, great. I think that does the trick for us on this so far, and then we'll revisit it next week. Is it, so? What else should we note that we want to come back to um, to flush this out? Uh, what else do we need to say? Is what like what what do we have to still talk about on this? Is there anything that we have to still talk about on this, or should I just clean up the document? So we know that we're going to override based on what's in the file. We know that we can mark things mutable. We know that we need a, a handler for that. Um, is there anything else that we haven't addressed? I think that's about it. All right, great. So let's just make a note in the meeting minutes. Um, so we spent a good amount of time on this. All right, let's see. Um, all right, this is a very important subject. Uh, so. Because it's going to affect everything. <laughs> um, all right, so let's see. Architecture. Okay, I cannot spell this. Uh, document three. Um, and then I'll push this up. Um, all right, so what else any, so we wanted to talk about linting commits and, uh, Hashim, what else, did you have anything else you wanted to talk about today? And then Sudhanshu? Yeah. Um, uh, on the other PR, you mentioned that, uh, we need more generic tests for notebooks. Uh, I yes. didn't quite, uh, get generic and how. Uh, what then? Okay. And also, I uh, also pushed to the PR uh, uh, for download button here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so which was that? Sorry, can you say that again? So the PR for uh, the download button, you did that one. 
and let's yeah, see. So no. why? Okay, so why was so why was this not going to work on the local builds? I didn't quite understand that. As you said, um, until the next release, because uh, it's uh, it just doesn't uh, show up. What I did is uh, it doesn't. Uh, it just removes the master. And uh, since we don't have it uh, on the release doc, oh. it won't uh, show up. It's a okay. for error. Remove master. All right. So yeah. So basically, if we build this, it will redirect successfully to to mass, or it'll successfully. Um, so if we so if we merge slash uh, the notebook. Yeah, so if, so if we merge this, then it will be, okay, yeah, so, okay, and then we click it, and target until, uh, my Python notebook, oh, I see, okay, um, okay, yeah, so this is a direct link download to the docs website, the notebook as it's stored on the docs website. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, let's see. Um, okay, yeah, I'm just wondering, should we be downloading the notebook from the Docs website or from GitHub? Probably from the Docs website, yeah. Um, okay, so you won't, so if it says, there's no dot, so it'll say slash master. I still don't understand why this is not going to work, so... Uh, I tried it. Uh, yeah. Because uh, it tries to. Uh, it's just about the master, right? If there's no dot in the. Oh room, yeah. Okay. So uh, on the local build. Okay. Okay. So now I understand. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. That was that made sense. I'm sorry. I wasn't following. Okay. Uh, yeah. On the local build, this will not direct correctly, um, and I don't think we have any way of detecting the local build right now. Um, so I tried it. Uh, it gave a four four error. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe we could add. I think there is like a, a GitHub Actions environment variable. Um, we could add a check for that. Um, we could say, um, and not is OS. Can we import OS in this? Or no? Let's see. Or let's see, yeah, actually, we're in docs.conf. Because, yeah, if we're it's, building, uh, basically, if we're building under GitHub Actions, then... You cannot import uh, inside the prologue, but you can use the variables outside. Well, so actually, it's imported outside. It doesn't matter because we're referencing the, the full URL here anyways. Um, so this, we shouldn't expect, like, it's not like if we clicked on this button, uh, it's going to download from the main site anyways, so we don't need to really worry about this. Um, we'll just note that, you know. Because, uh, like, if we're doing a local sure. build, then, you know, and this link is to the main site, we shouldn't expect that, that IPython notebook link to work anyways. Um, all right, so this is good. And it would work after the release. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so let's see. Yeah, I don't think we need the change log for the download button for the notebooks. Um, let's see. Okay. Do we have an issue for this? No, okay. Great, thanks. Um, so that's looking good. Um, so we merge this PR. Uh, download. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so and Sahil, we didn't talk about linting the commits, but we did talk about stuff that's going to be very relevant to your project here. Um, let's see. So 
on linting the commits um what was it what was it that you wanted to talk about i think you had a few cases that you were still enumerating um let's see what actually there are some cases where we need to add substitutions like yeah. should i yes specifically i saw a lot of should i funds failing because there is no folder like should i mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, the, the other one was like using those uh, uh, searching for words inside a file mm -hmm. and, and I just wanted to know that what would be an efficient way of opening the file and searching it for. Well, so I think that basically we're going to take out should I. Um, you know, all the plugins are going to get moved into the second party org. So that one we don't need to worry about so much. Um, and then the. There, the, are, there are similar cases. There are similar cases. Um, yeah, I noticed that I accidentally merged one the other day um, that, that, that had a uh, sort of a shortened path. Um, well, but this is okay. I mean, it's okay if there are, if there, if there do exist cases, um, right? Because we just want to do this going forward. Um, so the test case, right, should really only be run on the delta of the commit messages, right? Between the master branch yes. and whatever the branch we're on. Um, that's it, that's it. So I think I think we can probably safely go with what we have right now. If this is, if you're passing on 60 some percent of them, um, then... Um, if you're passing on 60 some percent of them and and uh, we can just merge it right and if we end up with um because let's see let's yeah if we I end... have some tests to write for this i guess yeah so. yeah definitely some test cases because i think yeah it looks like that got pulled out um or we had talked about it at one point but um so so let's let's get the test cases in and let's merge that um and uh, um, let's see. And then I think I think we'll go we'll we'll just merge it in to master from there and make sure that you know the test case is running on the delta. Um, and that way, if we if we end up with a with a job, if if we end up with a uh, kind of like the the change log test, right? If we end up with a um, commit or, or if we end up with a pr that violates the the test then we can still merge the pr right and the test won't fail in master right because it's just running on the delta um so we can sort of accept the fact that it wasn't perfectly formatted if if or that the that 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 the checker doesn't get all the cases that should be acceptable right Yes, it can uh, enforce the things to some extent, but not 100%. Yeah, it could be done. Exactly, right. At and the if, end of the day... If, if there are some new cases to cover, we can keep adding those. Exactly, things. right, because we're only looking at the delta. Um, uh, and, and, and we can choose at the end of the day to merge or not merge, you know, if it looks acceptable or not. Um, let's make sure to um, uh, run on the delta... Commit message. Currently, it runs on the delta only. Like Great. It is written that way. Okay. Um. And test test hard. Yeah. So there are two types of, of failing commits. Mm -hmm. Just a minute, I'll, I'll open that. Uh, actually, I did some you know analysis with that on my side. So so like most of the fails are in docs. Okay. And then should I and then test like I have a I have a list here. I'll just post yeah, why don't you post it in the in the comments or something? Um, yes, I'm I'm going to do that. I'm going to put all, all the anal analysis up there. Actually. Great, great, great. Thank you. Um, I think this will be great because this is a common thing that that will help keep us honest here. Um, and then Sudhanshu. Um, so I noticed that the ice cream sales is almost done. I think the main thing was, okay, six hours ago. Great. So you got the link. Perfect. I didn't see an update for that for some yes. reason. I don't know why it didn't tell me. Okay, great. 
this would be great. Yeah, that we want to make sure we put this in the change log, right? <laughs> um, user facing stuff definitely needs to go in there. Um, okay, great. Let's merge this on in. Anything else on your end? Um, uh, actually, I was not able to generate the docs for it. You were not able I... to generate the docs locally? Yes. Okay. Hmm, so interesting. I... I made an issue of it. Okay. Um, let's check that out. Um, uh, okay, so this is a symlink issue. Um, oh, interesting. Okay, this looks like, yeah, this looks like a bug. Um, I wonder, let's see, I wonder how we could reproduce this. Um, Actually, are, are you running this uh, command not from the development environment and the one which is installed from pep inside your directory, something like that? Uh, yeah, because, look. Because, because there, then, then there would be no docs folder with it. There would be only a wheel, I guess. It looks like we we ended up with it with the without a dash e install. Yeah. This is not in. Uh, this is uh, dev commands work in dev mode. Right? Okay, so that we know so far. Okay, so we know this. Um, I think that. Let's try uninstalling. Um, TFML and reinstalling with dashi. E. Yeah, this happens to me every once in a while too. Um, yeah, I think you're right um, that that it's it's the dev mode thing. So, and we'll just you know we'll keep the issue up to date for anybody else in the future, right? Okay, I'll try that. Yeah, yeah. You will not. You're you're not the first, and you're not the last to run into this issue. <laughs> so let's make sure we have all the commands, and then and then let's see. Let's comment back to see if this works or not, and, and close it if it worked out. Uh, if it didn't work out, then let's keep updating the issue because I'm I'm sure somebody else will run into the same thing eventually. Um, I know I have similarly. So it's easy but to. But the thing was that. Uh, what sort of code is legal and what is not? Because uh, that example with time log one, I was a bit confused. Like it was used in another place. Ah, uh, yes, and that was a place where, and that that was a place where, um, you know, I I had forgotten to take that code out uh, before we released. Um, so that was something because this legal okay, process. You, you is not, actually, yeah, this legal process is not something that is a automated check for. It's a uh, I'm trying to make sure that we we've got it. Um, and so obviously I had added that and I had forgotten to remove it. Actually, um, you you wrote that code, so I thought it, it's like the exact thing to do. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly that makes it all the more confusing. So you definitely did the right thing. Um, that's something that that I had forgotten to remove, and so we need to go to remove that. Um, and uh, I don't think that we have any use for it at this point because um, we've decided not to do that pinning. Um, so I'm going to go, I'm going to, I think, let's add a issue here. So let's remove, is that, I think it might already even have an issue. Oh yeah, oh no, never mind. This is, uh, this one died and then we need a new one to track that. So let's see, uh, service dev conducts. Um. All right. Service dev. Yeah, and then so we need to also document um, the fact that that on the contributing guidelines um so uh, 
Is this in here? No, because this is a really old issue. I can't sure we can get. Um, a new set of dependencies. No dependencies. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So this is a this is a really old one. Um, okay. Let's just move this. To the, let me just pin this and assign it to myself. Um, so I think I have a few more things that I have not articulated about the internal processes that I have to unfortunately um, make sure that we we follow. Somebody, my boss, told me they're doing audits. Um, <laughs> so um, you know, I'm. Uh, I uh, would love to hear that, not. Um, so so things may change um, if I fail an audit because um, I'm the one that's responsible for the legal process on this. So um, we'll see. Hopefully everything is up to, up to, up to par here. Um, anyways, all right, so anything else for today um, or that we need to make sure that we have on the agenda for next week? Uh you sent me uh, an invitation for today. Oh, I sent you an invitation for today. Crap. Yeah. OK, great. And I haven't received an invitation. OK, well, you got one for tomorrow, so that was the problem. <laughs> so, OK, so let me, let me move this to next week. Um, OK, save, send. And then, uh, Sudhanshu, I need to, yeah, oh, and I didn't get your email. That's why. Um, okay, uh, let me grab your email. Uh, so, Sudhanshu, yep. we're just trying to make uh, one-on-ones. Um, uh, let's see. So, so all of the uh, all of the mentors are going to have a one-on-one -on -one with which each mentor will have a one-on-one -on -one with each student, um, and and that way, you know, we get um, we get uh, we make sure everybody has touch base. Um, Let's see. And so, and this is next week. Uh, so let's just, um, you and I can try to find a time. Um, what is this? This was supposed to be. Okay. Great. I'm fine with it. Okay. So, um, and this is not my correct calendar here, but I believe I had another 30 minute slot after that. Um, so we could do, cause so Sahil and I will meet, um, at 9 a.m. on Wednesday. Do you want to meet it at, can you meet, uh, like 24 hours or let's say that that would be, uh, 20, 23 hours from now, um, on, on Wednesday. So next week, basically next week, uh, what would be our usual meeting? Um, so our usual meeting is here, uh, what's 9 a.m. for me. And then, so the next day, 24 hours from then Sahil and I will meet. And then could you do 30 minutes after that? Uh, yes, I'm fine. Does that work for you? All right, great. So I will send you an inv invite right now then, um, and we'll put that on the calendar. Um, all right, great. So now we're all scheduled here. Um, and so and so since it's next week, part of the idea here was that, um, you know, if, if you guys end up talking to um, Yash and Sakshasham and Himanshu um, uh, before then, um, then, you know, maybe because you're, you're sort of right now is the time that we're going to flush out your proposals. Right. Um, and and uh, and as we move into next week with the seventh will be the start of the coding period. Um, uh, you know, we'll try to make sure, you know, my meetings with you will be towards towards the closer side of that. So we're trying to get them. If you if you have any, you know, pre work now, right, things that we're looking at with the config. Uh, so you know, if you want to look more at the config stuff in that architecture document, and I'll post that and think more about that and look more at that. Um, that would probably be good um, for your project. And then you know, we and we can talk between then as well. Um, but but that'll that'll have us help us have a, have an informed discussion, right? So let's try to let's try to come come prepared uh with uh um you know with with things that you 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 want to talk about you know with within cloaks props proximity within starting your project right um okay great um cool and this is another thing so this is you guys probably just saw this so what i realize is just a meeting etiquette thing i've noticed that 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 
that a good way and this is like outlook does this by default and i realized why is if you send somebody else a meeting then you should put their you, you should put your name first so that they know who they were they're meeting with right away in case the names uh end up cutting off um so if because if you want to meet with somebody um then you know you want to make sure that they know who they're meeting with because they know their name um so when they see the invite arrive on their calendar you want to make sure that it's your name so they know who they're who they're dealing with immediately um so just a general general thing i realized that finally the other day i was like why does it always do that when i finally got it when the names got cut off so uh something to something to remember all right well thank you guys uh good talking to you today uh, and have a great uh great rest of your... one last day? yeah uh i asked you about the generic test oh yeah um, what do you mean by generic yeah okay so uh okay so generic test um Okay, let's just All right. Um for notebooks. All right. So, essentially, um um let's see. If you look at, for example, and this has to do, so I'm currently in progress refactoring the console test stuff. It's been a, been a couple weeks since I actually got the chance to touch it, but I, I'm, I'm pretty far along, I hope, knock on wood. Um, but uh, the way that we have this right now is basically any... So this is this is your friend this this area right here. So basically, this code here goes and 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 recursively loads every single object in DFFML. Um, so within the main the main package, um, and this code right here goes and um, goes and um, basically looks at the object. Um, looks at the name and checks if there's any any doc testable doc strings in the object. If it is, it makes a test case out of it. Um, and it makes a doc test test case out of it, uh, which basically says, you know, okay, it's it's going to create a function. Hey, wait a minute. I thought I merged the change to this. Fuck. Okay, this is actually creating a tuple, which is not a test case. God damn it. I swear I merged the damn change to this. Okay, anyways, as soon as I push the fix to this, <laughs> there will be, um, this will create a test case, not a tuple. Um, and uh, and any test case, you know, anything that's a function that has test underscore uh, will be run by unit test. Because what we do is we create an instance of the async test case class uh, for this, and you'll see it right here. So and it does a full path, right? So if you wanted to run a, a, a the doc test for one of these, um, you know, you'd say CLI, CLI version, version, uh, git hash. Um, and uh, this looks like it's repeated, which is not good. Um, so in test, test doc string, so this would be, um, you know, the doc test of it, I believe, right? And so if it had a console test, so if it has any console test directives in it, um, you know, we parse out, parse the doc string, check if any object has console tests, and automatically run the console test. Um, so what we'd be doing when I say automatically run, uh, you know, automatically uh, or automatic test case creation for notebooks is basically just um, this here is looking at this is like a recursive import. You just want to would want to you know recursively do like an R glob star IPython notebook and look for any IPython notebook files and create a test case class you know with a test function in the for that class that will test the notebook right. So that way, anytime somebody adds a notebook file to the code base, a test case class gets instantiated dynamically. Uh, within some Python file, which means that, you know, then the test case will get run. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. And that, that way it prevents us from adding notebooks that don't have tests. Um, and then we can sort of, you know, if we have a notebook that that we want to override and make the testing, you know, slightly different, then we can just override, you know, specific methods or something. Um, and in addition to that, um, the it, it will allow us to um, like for that um, 
For the stuff that you did where you ran some cells but not other cells, I was wondering there may be a way to sort of programmatically catch all invocations of cache download um, with like unit test mock and, and just modify that first call that, or that, that file path parameter. Um, but then, you know, you're dealing with also your search statement there and stuff like that. Um, so we'll, we'll have to figure that out. But, but ideally, this makes it so that we don't have to, uh, so that we can, we, can, we can have a uniform approach to testing all the notebooks um, and, and, and then not have anybody who writes a notebook have to deal with testing as well, right? All right. Uh, and, and, you know, this is something, you know, that's kind of like, you know, let's let's get two written. Let's so uh, let's do, and this is something for your proposal specifically. But but let's make sure that you've written another notebook, and then we can look at the test cases of each notebook, and we can say, hey, you know, what would one generic test case be, right? Um, and then at that point, um, you know, yeah, you have your generic test case. And, uh, and then, you know, as you write the other notebooks, you modify the generic test, test case as necessary, or you don't, right? And you don't have to keep writing test cases, right? You just write notebooks. But we can talk more so, about that with our, with our meaning. All right. So, okay. I, so, yeah, I wouldn't worry about it for now. I'd basically just write, you know, if you want to work on the, the notebook stuff, then, then keep writing the notebooks. Otherwise, so I need to, the, the other thing is that that cache, so the, the splitting out the confidence and the prediction keywords, um, I realize that yeah. that's going to have probably large implications on that refactor that's going on with accuracy. Um, so Sudhanshu, I know that you are working on, on phase eight as well. Um, so I was thinking, let's try to get that merged so we don't end up with a massive um, uh, rebase conflict in there. Because um, I think it's going to be more straightforward to rebase the, the, um, you know, any any changes to the, the confidence or the the confidence and prediction on top of accuracy changes than it will be to to do it into the accuracy changes, um, since that's so complicated. Um, they're both very complicated, large changes. Um, uh, the accuracy one just has like hundreds of commits. So I think that that's probably going to be more, more labor intensive. Uh, so we're probably going to wait on that for a little bit until we get the accuracy stuff going or through. So that All seems right. very close. Have you, have you gotten a chance to work on that Sudhanshu or I'm sure you're, I know you're busy. Yes. Okay. I've been working on that. Okay. Great. Great. Very exciting. It's, it's mostly like documentation and yeah. some yeah. tests which are not tested. Cool, cool. All right. Well, great. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll talk on, on Gitter and we'll talk more next week. Have a good one. Oh, and congratulations, of course, to all of you. Good, very, good, very good work. And uh, you all did great pre work and great proposals. So, very happy to have you on board. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good one. Bye. Bye. See you all.